Good evening. It's good to see everybody who's about, back out with us this evening. Um, it's good to see everybody this morning. Let's pray that as some of those who are traveled go home, uh, that they'll have a safe, a safe journey. If we turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 is going to be a key text. It's going to be a key text for uh, next, win- next Sunday night and then the, uh, the, the last Sunday of the month. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, have you ever sat and thought about how much time, effort, and energy is spent on learning? Learning one simple discipline, a trade, maybe even a hobby. Just think about all the time that was spent in a schoolhouse, learning different things that were supposed to help us to get through, get through life. You know, in 2018, 2019, that school year, the U.S. Department of Education says in all the public elementary and secondary schools, there was $800 billion spent educating children. That is a whole lot of money. But, you know, in 2021, the do-it-yourself industry, you say, well, what's the do-it-yourself industry? That's where you, you're tired of paying someone else to do it, and so you buy books so you can do it on your own. That industry, in 2021, made, it made $848.2 billion. It is suggested by the time that it's 2030, just seven years, that it's going to be $1.28 trillion is how much the do-it-yourself industry is going to make in this, in, globally. So sit down and to say that to have knowledge is very costly would be an understatement. Just in public education and in just people buying books and buying tapes, that in itself is almost two, it's over, it's over $1.5 trillion dollars. A year. And yet we pick up scripture. We pick up the good book. And notice what Solomon says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All the money spent, if we don't fear the Lord, doesn't even get us started in where we need to be. I mean, just think about it. How many things have people... How many things have people gotten themselves into in our society, spent loads of money learning how to do it, doing things that are extremely sinful, and they didn't even begin to start learning what true knowledge is? So this afternoon, this evening, what I want us to do just briefly is look at this idea of the fear of the Lord. The next time we're going to come together, we're going to talk about the wise man listens. So y'all get ready for that one. And then the, at the end of the end, end of the, the month, the Sunday night, at the end of the month, we're going to look at the foolish man doesn't. He despises wisdom. So we're also get, going to get ready for that one. When we start thinking about this idea of fear of the Lord, you may ask the question, well, well, what are you talking about? What are we talking about when we say fear of the Lord? There's two aspects I want to bring to our, our minds. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 13. And when we go to Hebrews chapter 13, I want to, to remind us that the events that the Hebrews writer is giving these individuals are the events that happened on Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 20. When he first gave the Ten, when he, the ten Commandments were first given. And notice the scene as the Hebrews writer lays it out before them to bring us back to remembrance because after all, they're wanting to go back to an old covenant. An old covenant was set upon this, this mountain, the Mount Sinai. It's unlike the new covenant, which is brought about in peace. Notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse and chapter 12, I'm sorry, and verse 18. He says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that may be and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet. And the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. 
For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And, Mo and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. When you start thinking about just how that old covenant came to be, it's a, it's a terrifying thought. In fact, Joshua was the one that was set up. If anything touched the mountain as Moses was up on the mountain, he was to, have it, he was to kill it. That's a terrifying sound. In fact, when you read the account in Exodus chapter 20, they do not want to hear the voice of the Lord at all. In fact, they send Moses up so Moses can get the information and come back and tell them. They don't want to hear the words anymore. That's a terrifying idea. And it's Exodus 20 and verse 20, he, Moses explains why that happened. It was so you may, the fear of the Lord, that you may not sin. That dreadful sight was to help them to see what a holy God could, could feel like if you're in front of him and you're not living correctly. That's a terrifying sight. But it goes on to talk about the new covenant, and we're going to tie this again together in 28 and 29 of, of Hebrews chapter 12. But it goes on again, starting in verse 22, talking about something very different. Something very different than something that is terrifying and frightening with the loud thunderous voices. Notice what it says. It reads, but you have come to Mount Zion. And the Mount Zion is the, the hill that Jerusalem was built on. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly and the, first, and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the blood of, of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Notice what it says in verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Notice that we may serve him in reverence. Reverence. The fear of the Lord also refers to reverence. Let me ask you a question. Imagine there was somebody that you respected very much. You respected whoever this was so much that there were certain words you would not use in their presence because it wasn't proper to speak in such a way. Now think about that just for a second. Whoever that someone would be. Maybe your father is standing there and there's a tone of voice you would not use with him. Or maybe your mother or grandmother, there's a tone of voice you wouldn't use toward them. When we start thinking about the most holy God that we serve, there in our society today has come this notion that I can treat God however I want and He will just understand. I can do whatever I want and He will just understand. That I don't have to worry about how I live or what I say or where I go or what I do or what I don't do. How I hide from my responsibility. He, he, we sit back and say, oh, He will just understand. Now think about it just for a second. If we have somebody on this earth that we treat with more respect than the most holy God, who is it we're showing reverence to? See, that's a good question. See, when we talk about a most holy God, if we talk about the Father, think about what all He has done. With His very words, He's created everything that we see. Think about Jesus who gave his life so you and I can have salvation, so we can be free from the penalty of our sins. Think about the Holy Spirit who inspired men to write down these words so they can read and we can understand what the will of God is. There's nothing that is hidden from his sight. 
when we think about the Lord that we serve, I'm not suggesting that we should always be terribly afraid of Him. But we should always show reverence to Him. This is the Almighty God of the universe that created you and I. That when we were still sin, Jesus died so we can have that relationship again. See, that's what we're talking about. The most holy God of the universe says, serve him with reverence and godly fear. So when we talk about the, the, the fear of the Lord is just the beginning of knowledge. If you put God in a proper place, there are things that you just won't do. You and I won't engage in. We will not even start to consider that we should walk down that path. See, those are things that godly fear does. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs. We will stay in this book most of the time this afternoon, this evening. When you turn to Proverbs chapter 14, and I know a lot of these little proverbs are truths. They're short, pithy statements. When you read them, they, they just kind of on the surface look like they... It just You can almost dismiss them, but yet when you start dissecting them, there's truth that is there that when we read and study, we can understand a more of a fullness of what God wants us to see and who God wants us to be. Notice what he says, Proverbs chapter 14, starting in verse 26. Notice he says, the, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Now notice that for a second. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Confidence. See, when we live our lives, we don't have to walk around with our head, head down like we're, like we're scared or not confident. And somebody asks us, how do you know you can go to heaven? We, because we believe in Jesus, and Jesus gave his life for us. How do you know there's a heaven? How do you know there's not? You know, there is something that, that I have started doing. I've started asking questions just to see answers. I understand the premise of things like evolution. I understand where that comes from. You know where the fastest way to stop an argument that comes at you about that? Ask the question. Well, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Or say, will you explain it to me? You tell me the answer. Explain it. You don't have to be mean and confrontational. But there's confidence. How do you know you're living the right life? Well, God has given us everything we need to know. And if I read and study it, according to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, I'll know everything that pertains to life and godliness. I will know those things. He will give it to me. There's confidence, which means there's not dreadful fear. Notice, his, place, his children have a place of refuge. Have you ever wanted to, to have a place to hide? A place that you can let all your, hope, you know, all your fears out and all the, the hopes that you really want to accomplish, let those be known? A place of safety? Well, what better place of safety could they be than with the Lord? The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It invigorates us. It helps us to keep going. To turn away one from the snares of death. You know, interesting enough, I had a conversation had a conversation. What is it you look at? I will tell you, I, when I coached basketball, there'd be people, um, they would go through slumps, you know, and it would be, even be kids I didn't coach. They'd go through a slump, and I, they, they couldn't hit a shot. They didn't, somebody even told me they couldn't throw it in the ocean. I said, okay, we can fix that. I said, when you shoot, what are you looking at? You know, every time when somebody is going through one of the slumps in the basketball and you ask them, what are you looking at? At least in my experience, you know what they tell me? I don't know. I just throw it up there. And I say, well, there ain't no wonder you're not making it. So let's narrow that thing down. 
Let's narrow it down. What should you aim at? The little curly Q thing that holds the net, what you should look at. Well, you say, how about the square? You know, there's a lot of bad angles when you're trying to hit that little square. You don't hit it just right. But, you know, no matter where you stand, you see what holds the net. What are we looking at? What are we aiming for? See, if we aim at sin, where's all of our attention? It's on the sin. If we aim at the Lord, where's all of our attention? On the Lord. If we're focusing on the Lord and we give Him the proper respect, what is not coming into our lives? See, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? If we focus on the Lord, the things that keep us away from Him doesn't enter because we're not focused on those things. Why do you think they have commercials? I mean, could we not sit down and watch a 30-minute program? It's really like 15 minutes. No longer than 20. Now, they'll tell you attention span isn't that big, but the movies are not 30 minutes long. The movies are hours long. What's the difference? Because they're trying to make you thirsty and go out and get something to drink. That's exactly what that is about. Focus. If we focus on the Lord, we don't have to worry about evil. He gives us comfort. Uh, Psalm 19, and Proverbs, Proverbs 19, verse 23. Proverbs 19, 23. It reads, the fear of the Lord leads to life. See, very similar to before, but notice what he says. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. Now, there are some translations that talks about how it's easy for them to sleep. It's easy to sleep. They have satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord gives rest or satisfaction. You ever sat and thought about this? There are people who spend their whole lives and I wonder what the Lord's will is for me. I wonder what it is that God wants me to be doing. But they're sitting there wondering about what God wants us to do. What does He want? He wants you to live. He wants you to live. See, serving God is all about living, not about fear. Dreadful fear of messing up. It's about living. Notice what it says if you turn back a couple pages of Proverbs 15 and verse 16. Very familiar verse. Sounds like, sounds like uh, something out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. Now notice, when we start looking at these things, we live in a society that wants to amass more stuff. We want to get more stuff. In fact, things are made to break so you will buy more stuff. I mean, that's the idea behind it. it. You know, when we start thinking about life and we think about stuff, if we're focused on stuff, who are we not focused on? We're not focused on the Lord at all. But what happens when we focus on the Lord and put the Lord first and we respect the Lord? Does not having stuff, but we have Jesus, is it? Should it cause us concern and distress? Well, it shouldn't cause us concern and distress. Let me ask you a question. If all you're going to do is drive around town, does it really matter what car you buy? If all you're going to do is drive around town, does it matter what car you buy? No. All you're doing is going around town. It doesn't matter which car you drive. Does it make you a bad person because you get an expensive car? No. But if you have one that meets your needs, you ain't got to worry about the bills either. See, that's something we need to sit down and think about this for a second. 
if we, if we have all this stuff and it gives us a great heartache because we know all the time that this stuff requires something else from us, how restful, how satisfied are we? But when we sit down and say, if the Lord is enough, and I don't care what it looks like, are we not much more satisfied? Somebody mentioned it's First Timothy chapter six and verse six. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment it doesn't matter to me how much stuff you have. It really doesn't matter to the Lord. But if you're dissatisfied because something is calling for your attention all the time, then we've got to go back to the beginning of wisdom. Is God in the proper place? Because he offers satisfaction. He offers satisfaction. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Notice what it says. It talks about wisdom as if wisdom was alive and walking among us in verse 12. He says this in verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way. And the perverse mouth I hate. Now really think about that for a second. The fear of the Lord steers us away from evil. It steers us away from evil. Well, how does it do that? Again, if we go back and think about it, if I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, the way that, that Jesus says the first and greatest commandment is, why would I want to sin against him if I love him that much? Now, if I do it willfully, and I say, I don't care what God thinks, and that goes back to the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, where if I sin willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's, that's a danger part. But when you sit down and think about it, if I want to... To learn and study what God's word says and apply it in my life and put God first in my life and honor him with the most that I have. How much am I going to entertain sin or how much should I want to? I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I'll tell you, the fastest gateway to sin is to say that ain't that bad. It's not that bad. Once we come to the conclusion it's not that bad, we're going to be right engaged in it. It is that bad. The things that are evil turn away. It's Job chapter 28, verse 28. Behold, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and apart from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord is wisdom, but depart from evil is understanding. The idea is when we put the fear of the Lord into practice, we won't love evil things. <laughs> Cannot have it. Let's go through some of the Psalms real quick. The fear of the Lord will cause us to worship Him with a pure heart and to do right. The fear of the Lord will cause us to worship Him out of, out of a pure heart and to do right. Psalm 111. Psalm 111. It starts out this way in verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the unright and in the congregation. Notice, with the whole heart in the congregation, with the upright, he's going to worship the Lord. He goes on and talks about all the mighty things and wonderful things that God has done and the great characteristics that we should love and admire about the Lord like he's full of grace and compassion. But notice how it goes on to say this in verse 10, the last verse. It reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all of those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. Who live the way that He laid out to live. We understand what it means to follow the Lord. Notice again, uh, Psalm 112, verse 1. 
Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Who delights greatly. Who has enjoyment in doing what the Lord wants. Those are blessed individuals. Why? Not only do we honor God here, but we get to honor God later face to face. Uh, Psalm 128. Psalm 128, it's a song of ascents. When you read through the psalm, it talks about a blessed man, how his wife will be a blessing to him, how his children will be a blessing to him, and how the table is going to be blessed. And, and so they might see their children's children. Man, that's a long time. Well, what happens? What is it in this song that when you start out, it, it starts at something base and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds? Verse 1, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Who walks in his ways. See, when we start talking about the fear of the Lord, yeah, we can, we can make hell as hot as we want to make it. We can fan those flames until each one of us can feel them tickling our toes. We, we can do that. It's about respect. It's about reverence to a most holy God. That one day you and I are going to have to give an account to. That you and I are going to have to give the answer. Why did you do this or why did you not do this? See, we get so afraid if somebody on the streets asks us that question. But what happens if God asks us that question? What would happen if God asked us? that question you know I'd, I'd like to have a really good response with it wouldn't you Lord I did all I could do I put you first you had the best place in my life what I gave to you was the best I could give to you and this is all I have see when we revere the Lord and we put him in our life in that one special place it doesn't matter if the world is burning down. And if you look at the news, guess what it's telling you? It's not far from it. That you're still going to serve the Lord. All of our chips are in that pot. And we're serving Him. It doesn't matter. Because we respect Him, we revere Him, we honor Him. That much. And we think about it. There comes a time when we need to be afraid. If we're not living like we ought, coming to the judgment can be a terrifying thing. And we ought to be afraid. But when we live with God, for God, in a healthy dose of respect and fear, we honor Him as God in our very lives, then we live a life where at the end He says, Well done, good and faithful servant. The choice of that is yours. On the judgment day, what will he say about you? If you're not honoring the Lord as you ought, we have opportunity to repent, pray, and come back, and we can pray with you and pray for you. If you're not yet put him on in baptism, start that journey today, we can do that. Or maybe you have a need outside salvation that you need to let, let me known to express. You can come forward as we sing a song of invitation.